All righty. Uh, welcome to game from start to publish with using Ruby. Um, today we'll be building a game from scratch. Uh, we'll be creating or recreating um, a basic implementation of the arcade classic Snake uh, from start to finish. And then we will publish it onto a platform called itch.io. If you have the the uh, Dragon Ruby engine from itch.io, that was if you download it ahead of time. If you don't, I recommend going into itch.io later, getting that um, by creating an account and claiming the Dragon Ruby Game Toolkit so that you can publish later if you wish to. Alrighty. So again, my name is Cameron Ghost. Um, this is a year of a lot of firsts for me. Um, this is my first official Ruby Central conference. Um, this is the first time I've given a workshop at a conference. And um, and again, uh, my first conference again, was actually Rails SAS, which was last month, where I met my good friend here, Tim Chopurini. Chaporian, sorry. <laughs> Chaporian. Um, and uh, he's kind of been a great friend. Um, you know, it's kind of been a testament to the Ruby community. I went to Rails SAS. I told Tim about what I'm doing, and he asked if you know if he needed my help, and I said, "Yeah, I'd really appreciate that." So, um, again, great community. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, the Dragon Ruby game toolkit. Um, that's not a typo. It's Dragon Ruby, one word. Um, uh, it has to do with like SEO purposes and stuff like that. Um, and it's a game toolkit. So, what kind of makes up the Dragon Ruby? Um, runtime is that first it targets the Ruby language spec so we get to use one of the best languages around Ruby to create um, to target multiple platforms right so then we have the runtime so the runtime run is a multi-level cross-platform runtime so it could target PC Mac Linux Raspberry Pi WebAssembly iOS, Android, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, Xbox, and Oculus VR, and probably more to come. Like there was a recent release where uh, you can use the Steam Deck as a uh, developing device, so you can actually, yeah. Um, and then, and part of the runtime is that it uh, implements something similar to MRuby, not CRuby. Uh, so you might notice there might be some differences in how the what's available in the Ruby code, and uh, yeah. All right, and then the game toolkit is built on top of the platform or the runtime, so now we have a nice game engine to use. And right now it's all <clears throat> the Dragon Ruby game toolkit is self-contained. You do not need any outside resources. Uh, you can it's. No dependencies, it's you download it, you can get started, and off to the races. And it's a 2D game engine, uh, but there are 3D capabilities being added. So like right now, they're doing a lot of work on drawing triangles, which might sound funny, but that's actually an important piece for building polygons and 3D models. All right, so the requirements. Uh, bring your own editor. You can use any editor you wish. There is no... Um, requirement on that. Uh, again, you need the, the game toolkit, um, either through the download or the files we provided. And then you need a Linux machine, a Mac OS, Raspberry Pi, or Windows. So how do you get it? Uh, I talked about one way. I'll give you uh, the itch.io link um, to download it. Um, there is actually, so I'm going to just kind of go through that for the viewers at home. Uh, let's see if I can load this. So I gotta do, I'm gonna be doing this a little bit. So there is the itch.io page, and then there is also dragonruby.org. And this is where you may be familiar with Ruby Motion. Uh, Dragon Ruby kind of came out of Ruby Motion um, by Amir and his team. 
And if you scroll down to the bottom, there's the game toolkit. You can go to read more. And uh, this has a much more detailed list of what features are available at different um, levels here. So the uh, standard is what you have now if you have the Ishtio. That is pretty much the standard uh, tier. Um, but if you want more, like if you want to be able to use C extensions or use uh, deploy to iOS or Android, you'd have to be on a higher level there. Okay. And let me bring that back. Come back. I'm going to have a lot of windows, so this is going to be interesting. All right, so an initial setup. And so we're going to just jump into it now. Uh, so wait, you need the folder unzipped and ready to go. Uh, one thing you can do if you want to follow along is you can take the unzipped folder and copy it directly to your desktop. And you want to have a terminal pointing at it, or you want to change directory into the terminal. And then you also want to um, point your editor to it, have it open in your editor. And then once you have that, we can actually run the game by running this command. Dot slash Dragon Ruby for uh, Mac or Linux, and then dot backslash Dragon Ruby dot exe for Windows machines. Oh, and I should also mention um, for Mac OS or it works on the Apple Silica as well. Um, the, old, the thing for Rosetta was for the publishing step. But it works flawlessly on my machine. Um, here. And if you run that command, you should see a window like this. Is everyone here? Hello, world? Good, good? So, uh, I'm here to help back, so oh, yeah. Thank you. I forgot, I forgot to mention that at the intro. <laughs> All righty. <clears throat> All right, so this is Hello World. And um, you can kind of see that it shows just some text and outputs an image. Uh, we can go through that code really quick, just kind of get an overview of what it is. So in the main.rb, there is a tick file, or yeah, there's a tick function, and that is passing in arguments. The arguments being passed in is the game toolkit environment, and that gives you access to all the APIs that are available within the game toolkit. Uh, the outputs, args.outputs.labels, or just out, yeah, labels, is a collection that you append um, or add to the array or collection the text, and it will output it. And we'll go this in more detail. Uh, this is kind of a simple overview. And then sprites is what you do for displaying images to the game window. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're going to do this a little differently. We're going to actually start off by publishing. Um, so if you have access to the internet right now, you can go through these steps with me. Uh, so first, if you haven't created an itch.io account, please do. Um, and then if you create an account, if you see, and yeah, create an account if you haven't. Okay. All right, so one thing you want to do is go to itch.io if you have internet. And I'm doing this for the people at home who are watching as well. Um, And then you want to go to uh, slash game desk new. And what this does is open up. Yeah, I'm going to do this. Sorry. This opens up a window like this. Uh, and what we need to do is create the game page. 
here we want to add a title and uh, we can call it uh, Ruby Conf Mini Snake. And when you type in the title, it'll autocomplete this uh, slug for the project web page. What you want to do is copy this or keep note of what it is because um, we'll need that to update the publishing step. Uh, short description, we can add in the, uh, like this is a basic recreation of Snake. Classification will be a game. Um, for now, uh, the kind of project will be downloadable. And then you're going to accept no payments. But itch platform, the itch.io platform is a great platform for uh, content creators to, if you want to monetize, you can. And then that's it for now. And go all the way down to the bottom and hit save and view page. So right now it's not very interesting. There's nothing there, um, but it's this is not public yet. It's in draft mode, as you can see in the top right here. All right. So now what we need to do is go back into the code editor and update the metadata. Um, give me a second here, and I will go. this back over so I can actually work on it while this is going on. All right. All right. So in uh, your code editor, if you go into, if you expand the file and go into my game and then slash metadata, there is a file called game metadata.txt. So, and to you, to publish, you do need an itch.io account. Um, so the dev ID will be your itch username. The dev title will be just uh, the name that you gave it. Or that was in the title fill in the form we filled out earlier. The game ID will be that slug that was added to the URL. So in this case, it was ruby comp mini snake. I'm sorry, the dev title is actually your name, not, not the game name. And the game title is the title that was filled in the form. And then you can uncomment uh, version and icon, and you can just leave those the same. And if you want to change the icon for your game, you can in the future. I'm going to open another tab in my terminal and go into the same uh, folder. I'll make this bigger so you can actually see it. Okay. Mm. And then we will do the dragonruby.publish. Add in the flag only dash package space my game. So this command will um, do the initial builds for uh, the game we're producing. And the reason I'm, we're starting off with this publish step is because Dragon Ruby makes it easy to iterate on your publish once you get this kind of set up. And, and it will automatically publish to itch.io after that. So, but we're going to just get the manual part out of the way so that we can continue on from there. Can everyone see that okay? 
or I can make it bigger. Has everyone gotten to this point, or does anyone need to back up? Um, Tim? All right. Uh, so after you have this command entered, press enter, and it will do a bunch of compiling and building, and it will uh, build a bunch of uh, files that you can see in now the builds folder. So if I go into here, and I can't zoom in on this. Um, if you go to builds, this builds folder should now be available within that uh, game toolkit folder. And here you can see that there is multiple build options. Uh, there is an HTML5.zip for WASM or WebAssembly. Uh, there is a Linux binary there, and there is a Raspberry Pi binary, um, Mac OS uh, zip folder or folder that you can. Uh, run the game from, or yeah, and then uh, again Windows. So, so fairly painless to produce uh, an executable for each of these platforms. And so once you have produced these builds, um, we can go into back into our uh, H.io game page and go to Edit Game, and then from here. We go down to uploads and we hit upload files. And you got to find the builds here. Which oh, I'm in downloads. That is my bad. Desktop. Driver B. Builds. And then from here, we can select uh, any build we want to target for our game. Um, you can pick and choose or uh, do all of them, but so in this case, you can do the HTML5 zip, the Linux 64, and let me see if I can expand this so we can actually see everything. And you got the HTML5, then that Mac OS, and then Windows. Upload. Uh, this might take a while, uh, but the game is fairly small right now at this point, so it should not take forever over hotspot. So you can see that the game size is fairly small, it ranges from three megabytes to six megabyte, and that's kind of the basic from hello world to publish. It's, only, it's a very small uh, game file there. All right. Okay. And then if we go back to the game page, if I go to view page, or I gotta actually I gotta save first. Go to view page, you now the games are there for download. Is everyone caught up to this point? Or done? All right. So there's the command again if you didn't get it the first time. If you want to. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go over the basics of making a game. Um, and this is the core idea of building any kind of game is that there's really three steps to it. And that is the game loop. In the game loop, there is handling input, uh, updating and calculating the current game state, and then rendering to the screen. And those are really the three uh, functions of game development that we need to worry about. We always want to take the user input, 
Then based on that user input, we need to calculate what's going to happen on the screen. And then finally, we need to draw to the screen. Um, all right, so in the main.rb file, we're going to create um, three functions. All right, uh, so you can go ahead and delete the hello world that is currently in your main.rb. And we will populate it with the functions to handle the game loop. So the first function we'll be doing is the handle input. Uh, this will be uh, creating a function, just handle input, and we'll pass in the arguments so that we can, within that handle input function, we can call the Dragon Ruby API. And then, and then on, um, after that, we're going to add an update function, and this is where all the functions uh, that will be used to update the game state will go, um, or be called. And we're going to leave the area above it for a place to put all our functions we're going to use to contain all the update logic. And then finally, there is the render function. And this function will draw things to the screen. Um, and again, we're going to reserve the area above that for rendering, or functions that will render components to the screen. And then finally, we see this tick uh, function again. And here we will actually call the handle input, update, and render functions in that order. And that is the game loop. Um, now, the tick function is very important uh, in Game Ruby or in Dragon Ruby Game Toolkit. It is the interesting um, programming wise because everything, once the tick gets called, it runs through everything and it reruns again and again. So if you're making the game, everything is being constantly being redrawn. It's not staying on the screen, it's uh, be being removed and updated and drawn again every time. Uh, so, and it does it 60 frames per second, so we have nice smooth animations. Again, right. kind of went ahead there. All right, so we're going to set up the scene, and here we're going to first by start by drawing a grid because in the original game Snake, the snake travels along a grid, uh, and uh, so we're going to start by doing that. So in your main.rb file, at the very top, we're going to add a constant called grid size. We're going to set it to 20. I picked 20 because it worked nicely. It's, it, it cut evenly between the uh, aspect ratio that uh, Dragon Ruby renders in. And then above the render function, we are going to create a, another function called render grid. And then within the render function, we are going to call that. And this is just setting it up to, to uh, render once we put content inside the render grid function. All right, so now we're gonna go back into the render grid, grid function. And now the code will be highlighted as I go along. So don't, don't try to read the gray text, it'd be very hard. Um, so we're gonna start off with the X axis. So we're gonna actually draw lines vertically along the X axis first. So we're gonna actually convert, we're gonna create a tile nu numeric grid essentially by taking the width of the window, which is the arguments grid dot width. That is taking the width of the current game window and divide that by the grid size um, to split up grid along the x-axis. And then we are going to use um, a nice Ruby method here, x-axis dot each width index. So we can iterate through each um, vertical grid. And 
then finally, um, this is similar to what was in the Hello World where we had the args output stop text or label, uh, this is args output stop lines. As you can expect, it is used to draw lines. Um, so we are going to use the hash syntax. Um, you can actually pass in an array as well, but I think the hash is a little bit easier to kind of understand what is necessary to draw the line. So we have the x position value. So we're going to take the index that's provided by the each width index, multiply that by the grid size to get its actual position within the game window. And we're going to set y to 0 because we want to actually draw that at the bottom of the window. And then uh, we want to provide an x2 position and a y2 position because it's a line. Uh, again, uh, it's going to be a vertical line, so the x2 is going to be the same value as x. And then y2 is going to be the top of the grid which is the grid dot height there. All right, so now we need to do the same thing for the y-axis. It's uh, essentially the same code, except for y-axis we are doing it, drawing horizontal, horizontal lines vertically across the game window here. So we're going to take the grid height and divide that by the grid size. And then the same thing for the each width index um, and along the y-axis. And the x and y values kind of reverse in this one. So x is going to start at 0, which is going to be the left side of the screen. y will be the y index times the grid size to get its actual position within the game window. And then x2 will be the right side of the screen. So we're going to use the, the grid dot width there. And then again, since it's a straight line, uh, y2 is going to be the same as y1 or y. So next up, we're going to start by drawing the head of a snake. We're going to draw a green square in the middle of the grid. And yeah, actually, yeah. Actually, let's go back into So if you're following along, you should see the window. If you, uh, how many of you closed the window or kept it open? Or who kept the window open for? Okay. Um, good. Um, so one thing we need to do is so does everyone see a grid drawn at this point? So now drawing the head of the snake. All right, so we're going to actually add another function that was going to be a part of our uh, tick loop uh, or be called in the tick function. And that is defaults. And this will be used to hold the original state of the game. Right. And you can do this right above the tick function. It's a common place for it to go.
And then within defaults, uh, we will create a, we're going to use the state uh, pro uh, property available to us um, from the game toolkit. And this is to keep state, to keep state within each tick so that at any point in the game, you can keep data from tick to tick. Without this, it would be impossible to kind of traverse data between each tick. So we're going to memoize um, using the uh, memoize operator there with um, the pipe pipe equals. And we are going to create a square by setting the x position to the uh, args.grid.width divided by 2. And that way it's centered on the x uh, axes. And then for the y direction, we will do args.grid.height divided by 2. And then finally, uh, we'll take the width and height to be the grid size, so it will be the same as the grid. And then RGB values for red, green, and blue, uh, we can add 23, 245, and 23. And that will create a bright green, lime green square. So now, after doing that, we need to update the tick function to call default defaults and pass in the arguments into the parameters there. So now every time tick will get called, uh, if that is not has not been instantiated yet, it will do so from this point on. All right, so now rendering the snake, uh, even though we're doing the head right now, the snake will come, the rest of the snake will come later. We will do um, create a function render snake, and we'll do this right above the render function. And then we are going to call args.outputs.solids, and this is another collection that outputs squares and rectangles. And then we're going to pass in args.state.head, which is the um, state or the uh, property we set in the defaults function. Okay. Now, if this is hooked up properly, yes. Should be seeing this now, hopefully. Is everyone seeing this at this point? Uh, I have one question. Yes. Uh, what was the grid size supposed to be? Uh, 20. Can you see the method that you had on the slide one more time? Oh, yeah. Go back to the method here. Yes, thank you. That one? Oh, there's one more step after that, sorry. Uh, you must add render snake to the render function. So if you don't see that green square, that is why. So th this is kind of the workflow of building a game in Dragon Ruby. You kind of go through, um, create the function, call it within the, the appropriate function. So in this case, we're rendering, so we're calling the render function. And if you're behind, um, we have the uh, source code available if you want to. And we have a, a get, get repo where you can get to the branches are labeled by the slide numbers there. So there is a branch for 8.2.2 that will take you to exactly this point. Um, you can raise your hand and uh, Tim can get you set up there. All right, so now we got a green, uh, green square on a grid. Not very exciting. So let's add movement to actually make it interactive. And here is where we're going to actually start handling input uh, for the first time. We're going to do a couple things. Uh, we're going to create some local variables within this function. Inputs equals args.inputs, and that's really just uh, not to have to type in args.inputs for the rest of the code. 
And the same thing for head. We are going to um, set head equal to args.state.head. So again, we don't have to type it a bunch of times. I'm trying to save some keystrokes here. Yeah. All right, so once we have those local variables set, we're going to do if inputs.left, we're going to set the head direction, head dot direction equal to left, and that's a symbol there. And then else if inputs dot right, we'll set the head dot direction equal to right, and you know, we can go down the line for each and up and down as well. on or still, still going? All right, so now we're going to create another constant at the top of the file right underneath the grid size. We're going to set uh, speed equal to 10. And uh, you might be thinking this is might be the speed of the snake. Um, it's actually, we're going to wait every 10 ticks before we actually increment the snake. So that gives it that nice, you know, grid jump position like the old, old arcade classic. And then we are going to create a new function called move snake, and this will be above the update function. And we're going to call, create a local variable called head again um, to save some keystrokes here. And then the vector, we're going to set, create a hash with the x position and the y position, or directions. And then after that, we're going to do a case win. Um, we're going to take the head dot direction, which was set through handle input. And then based on the direction, if it's right or left, we're going to alter the uh, x vector value to, uh, so when right, vector dot x will equal 1. When left, vector x, vector dot x dot will equal negative 1. Down and up for, uh, will affect the y value. So after that, we're going to alter or we're going to increment the x and y direction based on those values. So um, for head dot x, we're going to plus equals the grid size time d vector in x direction. So that way, if there is no, so if the, the x vector value was zero, it won't move in that direction. Um, but if it's positive, it'll move in the right direction. If it's negative, it'll move in the left direction. Um, and same for the y direction. If the y direction is positive move up. If it's negative, it'll move down. And then finally, we need to update the update function. And here we are going to do a um, args.tickCount.mod0. So if um, args.tickCount.mod0 is um, and pass in the speed a constant, and what that will do if that's equivalent to having done um, is a tick count mod uh, speed equal to zero. All right, it's 
the same thing, it's just a shorthand uh, for it. And then within that if uh, block, we're going to call in move underscore snake dot args. Yes, um, so it is jumping ahead by 20 spaces, and you kind of see, it kind of, kind of gives you that, um, the classic arcade snake, it kind of like, it wasn't a smooth transition, it was like, it went from one block, then the next block, and the next block, but you, it, it's small enough to say that you could see the motion, kind of, it, it, I'll show you right now. And okay, I might be jumping ahead too, so. Yeah, it's all right, it's okay. Um, so, if this is, so... Right, so that's it moving around. That's jumping 20 um, uh, pixels, essentially. Yeah, and so it gives it that nice little kind of, um, yeah, retro, thank you. All right. So now we have an exciting game where a green dot moves. <laughs> um, but one, one of the philosophies of the Dragon Ruby community is to publish early and often. Um, this is kind of one of the things I wanted to show. Is like, so once you have something that is presentable, you can go into the command line here. And then we can call that Dragon Ruby, and we can call that Dragon Ruby publish um, command again. And without the flag, and hit enter, and we'll do the build. We'll do the same builds. It'll take a little bit. And so, and this is an important piece. Uh, it uses a tool called Butler under the hood, and this automates the deployments to the itch.io platform. And I'll kind of go back to the window here. You'll see, um, welcome to the itch.io command line tools. And what it's doing is the authentication on the itch.io platform so that once you do this, you don't need to do it again. So I'm going to go ahead and authorize. And it's done. I'm going to go back here. OK, I have the name. Invalid game. Okay. I've done this a billion times, and this, this is where it fails. Um, let me try that again. Okay, um, let me go back into my game window here, make sure I have the right name in my, oh, I have this name incorrectly, that's why. So that the project URL is very important and the uh, game ID of the metadata file. So going back to that again. All right, so now it's working. So now it's actually pu publishing uh, to the files I had already published. So if you had not put every executable up there, it would only publish the ones that you want up there. And this will go. And so again, one of the um, Dragon Ruby community really 
uh, embraces this kind of um, methodology is probably early, published early and often. Um, so they really gave us the tools to do that um, fairly painlessly. Okay. And then, so we, we saw the snake moving. Um, let's see, and I, I'll show the timestamp. It updates as well. We'll see that this was published 46 seconds ago. All right, so now we're going to set boundaries. Um, so this is drawing the walls for the game. So having a boundary to hit uh, so you can lose the game. All right. So we're going to update def defaults. And feel free to check out the branch 10.1 because um, it's going to be quite a bit of typing for this one. Uh, it's the args.state.walls.left. Um, so we're going to create the left wall. Pass it a hash uh, using the memoirs operator there. Um, then we're going to set it to the left side of the screen, starting at the bottom, because uh, everything is drawn from the bottom left of the position. The height will be the grid height, and the width will be the grid size. And RGB, you can set 12, 33, 245. You are free to use any RGB value. Um, that's just what this will create a nice blue wall or not nice, depending whether you like the color or not. And then we're going to do the same thing to the right. Same thing for the top. We're just adjusting the X position and the Y position, and then the width as well. Actually, for the uh, top and bottom walls, the height will be the grid size. So it's going to be one rectangle uh, going up the top and bottom of the screen. And then um, for the top wall, the Y direction, we're going to take the grid top and minus the grid size, and the width will be the going across the screen. Right. Then the bottom, very similar again. We're going to take the arc side grid dot left. For the X position, the Y position will be the grid dot bottom. The height again will be grid size and the width will be the grid width. So once we have all those, um, we're going to create a render walls function above the render function again. Uh, we will create a walls local variable there and set it to args.state.walls. And again, that's to save some time. Our keystrokes here. And then the out args.outputs of solids, we're going to append an array of all the walls. So you can just put a bracket, walls.left, walls.right, walls.top, and walls.bottom and it will output to the solids collection. Hey, Cameron, I didn't get all the variations of the walls. Okay. Um, I pulled out the source code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim, Tim can help you with that. And after you have all the walls set up, you can go to render walls and the render function. And then after that, you should see the walls rendered. So, you should see four blue lines going around the game window there. But there's a problem. You'll notice that the snake is not in that wall area. 
Um, so what we can do is, in Dragon Ruby, there is a cool feature. Um, if you ever played the game Quake, it's usually called the Quake Terminal. Terminal, and it allows you to do a drop down. And to do that, you press the back tick key or the tilde key, which is usually underneath the escape key there. And then there is this menu up here. It says show menu. You can click that and go to reset game. This will start at the initial state of the game. If I do that, you should have the snake in the middle with the blue wall going around the game. Yes. For um, the render or the oh the boundary oh we haven't started that part yet. So now to actually do the collision detection, which is to actually stop the snake and keep it within the bounds of the game, we need to uh, handle the collision detection. So we'll create a function handle boundary collision. We'll set some local variables within this function here. Now this code's a little long on the next line. Um, I'll scroll so you can see it. So for every, we're going to pass in a collection of the, or create a collection of walls, uh, the walls that left, top, right, bottom. And then there is a special method here called any intersect rect rectangle, right? And with the question mark. So what this does is it, it creates a, um, it iterates through everything in the collection there and checks if it, it intersects with the head right there. So if at any point, any point of the rectangle is within another rectangle, it will return true. Next up, we are going to clamp the head, uh, the X and Y position of the head so that it stays within the min and maximum allowable area, which will be where we define the walls. So head.x will equal to head.x.clamp, and then we're going to pass in the parameters. We're going to take the left wall and get its rightmost side. It's going to be a little confusing to read that, walls.left.right, but it says taking the left wall and finding its right side. And then we're going to take the right wall, or walls dot right, and get its leftmost side. But we also need to subtract the grid size as well because of how um, the rendering starts at the bottom left. If we don't add this, it will actually be able to go on top of the wall. So. Um, and then we're going to do the same thing for the head dot y and head dot uh, we're gonna do head dot y dot clamp and we're gonna take the bottom dot top so the bottom wall we're gonna take the topmost part of it and the top wall we're gonna take the bottommost part of it and we're gonna subtract the grid size again because it's a similar thing to the x direction there's there could be overlap if you don't do that. Alright and then finally in def dot update we're in the update function here. We're going to call handle boundary collision args. So with that, you should be able to move up and not go past the wall. But if you're the snake has already gone past the wall, and you need to go back. Uh, make sure you go back and reset the game so that the character is in the middle. Right. So 
next up is scoring. So again, the snake, there are these collectible items you go around collecting that appear in random locations. Um, they uh, do two things, they increment your score and then also make the game more difficult as you progress through it. So we will be implementing those right now. So we're going to create a spawn collectible function. This will be above the update. We're going to take the, uh, we're going to check if there is a thing in state called collectible and check if it's nil. If it is nil, we will create a random x and y value. And we will do, for the x direction, we're going to take the grid width divided by the grid size, and we're going to subtract 2. 2 is a word number. Um, we're subtracting 2, uh, again, because of how the offset works with the, uh, the collision with the wall. And we're going to call dot randomize ratio dot ceiling. And ratio will give us a number that has decimal values on it. So we do ceiling to round it up. And we're rounding it up so that it doesn't overlap the bottom wall or the left wall. All right, and then next we have the args the state dot collectible. We're going to actually create it and this is just going to be another square, similar to the snake head. Uh, but we will be making this red. And for, so for the x value, we will pass in the x position times the grid size. And the y position will be y, random y position times the grid size. And the height and width again will be grid size. And then RGB, uh, 233, 2323. It's a red color. You can make it whatever you want. And then finally, we're going to add that to spawn collectible. Now, at this point, you won't see it yet because we haven't rendered. So we got to create the render function for it. So we will create a render collectible uh, function above the render function. And we will pass in args.outputs.solids and then append the args.state.collections or collectible. Now you should see a little red square up here, but we can't interact with it yet. You'll see that this, oops, no, that's a head, sorry. <laughs> but that's what we'll be implementing is that part. So right now it should just render and can't interact with it. Um, to do that, uh, so we render collectible in the render, and then next we'll have to do the collecting, and this is where we we'll implement collision detection, detection again. So we'll create a uh, function called handle collectible collision. And we'll do a return if the collectible is nil, because um, there's no point in checking for it if it doesn't exist yet. And then we will do args.state.collectible.intersect rectangle on the check with the uh, head of the snake. And then uh, we'll take, uh, if, it collects this, uh, if the snake inter intersects with the collectible, we will set it to nil so that it could respawn in a new, new spot when the update is called again. All right, and then after doing that, we will um, call handle collectible collision within the update function. That will give us what I showed you right there, where it will jump once you collect it. And next up, we got to finally inter increment the score. Um, to do that, uh, we're going to add score to our defaults. So we're going to have args.state.score. Uh, we're going to minimize it to zero, so it only gets assigned once there. And then 
finally, we're going to update the go back to update the handle collectible collision function and set the state score to uh, plus equal one. So finally, we have to render the score. Now that we have the um, score being incremented by the collision, uh, we're going to do our outputs label labels, and we can pass an x direction, y or x and y position, and the text. Uh, for the x direction, we are going to take the left grid, so the left side of the screen, and we're going to shift it to the right, which is a nice method for positioning that Dragon Ruby provides. And we're going to multiply it twice to grid size, just so it appears between grids. Uh, the y direction, the same thing. We're going to start at the grid at the top, and then we're going to shift down by twice the grid size there. And then set the text. We're going to use some string interpolation to set the score and set it to args.state.score. And then finally, we'll go into render and call render score. And that will give you this result right here. Where we have score in the top left, with the one, and it will increment every time we collect a collectible. Uh, and next we'll add sound. So this is the WAV file I uh, provided. Um, this is kind of the fun part. You can kind of pick and choose what sound you want. Um, Itch.io is a nice good resource for finding sounds that are free um, and common or Creative Commons license, so free to use. Um, so if you have any sounds you want to add, um, but for this uh, workshop, please use the collect.wave and add that folder or add that file to the sounds folder within the my game folder and then this one's really simple you go back to the handle collectible collisions and then you will do args.outputs.sounds and append the sounds slash collect.wave and that's uh, pretty simple to add there and if I go to There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And a nice little coin select, um, collect sound. Or my, my audio is off, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, every time you collect it, it will play that sound. An important thing to note is that dot .wav files will play once. If you do a .og vorbis file or dot .ogg, it will continuously play. So if you want to add music, you can add that. I'm not really sure we have much time for this one. Um, so this is actually increasing the difficulty of the game by increasing the body of the snake. And this one takes quite a bit. Uh, so in defaults, we are going to, at the very bottom, add a empty array called args.state.body. And we're, we're going to memoize it so it only gets set once because we don't want to keep destroying the body of the snake. Um, and then before the update function, we are going to call the grow, uh, we're going to create a grow body function. And this one is quite a bit. Uh, we're going to take the segment. And then if the, if the state.body has anything in it, we're going to use a ternary operator here. Um, and if the body does have um, a segment in it, we will clone it. So we're going to take the last element in that array and clone it. And then we're going to take the head and clone it as well. Or if the body is empty, we're going to clone the head. And the vector, uh, again, this is similar to the movement, um, handle it movement, is we're going to set an x and uh, y directional um, value of 0. 
And then this is going to be different from the move snake function here. We're actually going to go the opposite direction. So if the, and this is to give it the appearance that it is popping to the side of whatever direction it is moving in. Um, that is uh, very important. Otherwise, it will just be on top or it will be not where you expect it to be. Uh, so we're going to take the segment direction uh, if it's right. Um, you could also use case win. Um, if it's right, so we want it to go left. So we're going to set the x direction to minus 1. If it is left, we want it to go right. So we have a positive x direction there. And then for up and down, so again, if it's going down, y, we want it to go up. And then if it's up, we want it to go down. And then uh, similar to the movement, we will increment the uh, X and Y positions based on that vector in the grid size. Um, take the grid size multiplied by the X direction of the vector and take the segment dot Y position and uh, add the grid size and the vector Y direction. And after that, we will append the segment to the uh, body that we set in the defaults. All right, so now after we have this function written, we're going to call this function within the handle collectible collision. Um, we will add grow bodies and pass in the arguments there right after the sound play, playing. And then finally, we're going to update our render snake function to now we're going to pass in an array with the args.state.head. And then we're going to use the splat operator to expand the state.body and display that as well. Right. So if you followed along this far, you'll have a weird thing happen. Um, the snake head, it will be detached from the body. Um, so you'll move the snake around, you'll collect a collectible, and then the, collect the segment will appear where you, the snake last was and stay there because we have not added movement to the body yet. So now we've got to refactor the snake movement to take care of the body segment as well. So handle inputs, uh, we've got to do a little bit of update there. So we're going to wrap the um, the directional logic in a args.tickcount.mod.0 speed. And the reason we do this is we, um, it prevents the head from getting detached from the snake. You can try removing it and um, you, you can play around with it. It's interesting movement. Then we're going to take the head that was a local variable earlier in the function there. And we're going to set its previous direction equal to its current direction. And this is going to allow us to set the, uh, send the previous direction down the body segment to update in its current direction, or for each segment in the body. And then for each direction left, we do not want the snake to be able to go back onto itself, because now it has a body trailing after it. Um, so if the input is left and the previous direction is not right, um, don't let it go left, essentially. Or, I mean, if the previous direction is not right, let it go left. But if it was right, don't let it go left. And we do that for each of the directional inputs. Whatever the opposite value is, we want to make sure the previous direction is not equal to that. So now we need to update the move snake function to handle the body of the snake. So we're going to actually just create a local variable snake. And um, like the render function, we are going to create a array, pass in the head, and use a splat operator on the body to expand that array. And then we're going to do snake.each with index. And we're going to pass in the segment and index. So in the previous code, it said head. We're going to actually change head to segment. Um, but before that, we're going to do 
the, we're going to set the segment's previous direction equal to the segment's direction unless it is to index because that's going to be handled in the handle input because at index zero that is the head of the snake. And the segment dot direction, which will be its uh, current live direction, will copy the previous snake segment direction by taking the index minus one and grabbing its previous direction. And again, unless it's the head of the snake, because there is no previous part to the body. And then line 27, we have. Uh, it should say head dot direction. We're going to change it to segment dot direction. And then at the bottom where we update the head dot x and y, we're going to change that to segment. And then finally, we need to check if it collides with itself. Take the create a new function called handle body collision, and uh, it's going to be the same as the wall collision. We're going to check if any of the body intersects with the head. So that's the state dot body dot any intersect rectangle and args state dot head. And we are going to just output or puts collide with body for now because um, we have to add the game over state, which will come next. And then finally, we need to go into uh, update args handle body collision. So when you have this and you run it, um, you will notice that every time your body grows, or not grows when you enter, but you have to have a body long enough. So you have to have a minimum five um, blocks to the snake. And then when you go in, if I can do it, right? It's really hard <laughs> sometimes. Um, if you do that, you'll notice in the terminal that collide with body, right? But one thing I noticed, I just ran into the wall. I print out collided with body a lot. The body's head of the snake is now detached. Um, we could either we could, we could clamp the value so the body of the snake can't go out of the game, but once the collision happens, it's really game over, right? So we're going to add the game over state. So in defaults, we're going to add args.state.game state, and I'm going to set a default to in play, and then in the handle body collision, we're going to add. Uh, change the game state. So we comment out that that puts um, and put in the game state equals game over. And handle body collision I was already called, so that should be fine. Next, we have to do render game over. And this one will above the render function, we will add a render game, and then we're going to output a label. Um, there's quite a bit to this, uh, but you can just output game over by doing x direction. You can do it in the middle of the screen. You can do argsocgrid.width divided by two, and then um, take the argsocgrid.height divided by two, and we're going to shift up 16 pixels. Set the text to game over. The size enum is a value passed in, which is just like size of text, so like 10 points or something like that. Um, so the smaller it is, the smaller the text will render. The bigger it is, the bigger it will render. The alignment enum, there is 0, 1, and 2. Uh, 0 is left aligned, 1 is center aligned, and 2 is right aligned. Um, and then there's also, you can print out the final score um, was so many points. Um, but we're running out of time, so I'll just move ahead. And um, we're going to create this call to action to press escape to try again. So in def, in the render function, we're going to update it. We're going to create a if statement. Um, so if the game args game state is equal to game over, which is what we send, set in the collision with the body, uh, we will render game over. Otherwise, 
Otherwise, continue to render everything else in the that was previously previously making the game run. And then finally, we need to be able to reset the game. So in the handle inputs function at the very top, or very top, um, we're going to do an if statement. And if the game state is game over, we want to do an inputs.keyboard.key down underscore down dot escape. So as it kind of reads, if you press escape on the keyboard, it will trigger this. And we will call dollar sign GTK dot reset net underscore next underscore tick. And this is to safely reset it. Um, there. And then again, you can publish your finished game. So just to show the. Uh, Game over. You press escape. Let me click on it there. Press escape. It goes again, and I can move in a direction. Uh, kill the snake and start again. Right. And then this one here. And I can do Dragon Ruby publish and deploy it to. Uh, Ish.io. Right. Okay. Now what? So I know Snake's not the most exciting game, um, but it does help show the basics of building a game, and that you can see that things kind of move from if something is input based, it starts with handle input, then updates the game state. And then finally to render. That's kind of the uh, general direction the code goes uh, when building a game. Um, so there are some resources for everyone if you want to continue to learn to make games in Dragon Ruby. Um, first, I would join the community. Uh, there is a Dragon Ruby Discord. I will provide the link in Slack. Uh, they are a lively group and very, um, um, very, uh, you know, interested in growing a community. Um, there are, you know, I mean, they're very helpful. If you have any questions, you can ask, and a lot of people will jump on to answer. So, really helpful group of people. Uh, resources, documentation. So, the dragonruby.org website, if you go to the game toolkit, the docs are there. But if you open up your, uh, you may have noticed this. Let me bring this over there. Um, if you go up to the top, so in Dragon Ruby, there is docs. Um, go to docs.html. You can open that in your web browser. It's all local. That's the docs that matches the website. Um, the whole thing is there and with a lot of samples. Other cool thing is samples. There are a lot of them. So if you are interested in creating a certain genre of game, they have great starting points. Like there's a dungeon crawler, there is a fighting game, there is a you know, platformer, Mario, um, all kinds, almost for any kind of genre you can think of, uh, great starting points. And then that's well, you know, explore, have fun with it, um, create interesting games and yeah. So one thing I want to show you, I made a couple games. So uh, game jams are an important part of the game community in general. Um, so Ish.io has a really cool explore game jams. And right now the Dragon Ruby community is um, has a 20 second game jam, which is there is a uh, so when you have someone plays a game for the first time, you really have 20 seconds to capture their attention. Uh, so it's a 20 second game jam where it's really focus on the mechanic you want to show to the player. And um, that one's not apparent on this one. It's There's a lot of game jams. I mean, look, I mean, you can keep going down, 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 down. I mean, there's a lot. So the game community is big. Um, so yeah, that's a fun one. So uh, you can join any game jam mostly. Uh, some game jams are engine specific, like sometimes they'll have like a Unity game jam or whatever, uh, but a lot of them are not. 
And then if I go to my dashboard, I created two fun games, um, or funny games. Like this one, it's called Break Fast, and you play as a cereal box trying to escape from the back of a truck. Uh, this was a 20 second game jam. Um, this is deployed on uh, WebAssembly, and hopefully it doesn't take too long to download. And then I also have another one um, that I did for another game jam called uh, Bracky, which is Bracky is a well-known uh, Unity uh, developer in the Unity community. Um, that's weird. And it's not real. Run game. So this one still downloading because I'm on my hotspot. So, and then I just press start space, begin. So, play it as a little weird box. You jump, you get an attack, which I forgot to attack. All right, so, and it has a loud noise, and you're supposed to break down the door, and you have 20 seconds. So, this is my first 20 second game jam. Um, I've always been interested in games like, fighting games like uh, Smash Brothers, so it's kind of getting the basic mechanics of that. And I had my daughter draw the graphics, uh, she likes to draw. Um, so this is a great way to get kids involved in coding, um, is to, you know, if they're artists, get them, you know, to get their content on here. Um, and then this other game here has a nice title screen there. Um, it's called It's Not Real. I'll make it bigger. Might be able to see it. Yeah. So it's got a little guy move around and you jump. So high. And the theme, of, and this is a game jam. The theme of it was not, it's not real, so we kind of got a dreamlike theme, and then like some of the clouds are fake, and you kind of get drum through it, and um, it's kind of random position on where it is. Um, you can't see it very well, but there is something chasing you. Let's see. Oh, you can't really see it, um, but it's like a, a nightmare with hands kind of going up screen. It's kind of it's kind of fun. But yeah, making games is fun. Um, I mean, I hope I really showed the basic building blocks of, I mean, everything goes to outputs. Uh, yeah. So, well, thank you for everyone who stuck around and followed along. I really appreciate that.